So I want to now shift to um, the panel uh, looking to the future federal energy innovation strategy. So for the, really the rest of the day, we're going to be talking about what to do and how to do it. And uh, I'd like to introduce first uh, Alexis Madrigal. Uh, and, hey. Uh, Alexis is, is a senior editor covering technology for TheAtlantic.com, and hopefully you've all been reading his work, excellent work. He's also the author of a forthcoming book about the surprisingly long history of green technology, and he's the founder of 48 Hour Magazine, which is a high-speed media experiment that garnered attention from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and BBC. And before that, he was at Wired.com, where he built Wired Science into one of the most popular blogs in the world. Uh, which was also nominated as one of the best uh, websites in the 2009 Webby Awards. And um, he is a visiting scholar at University of California Berkeley Office for the History of Science and Technology. And, uh, Alexis will introduce our speakers. Great, thanks. Can I hear you? Am I on yet? Yeah. Uh, I'll use this mic until that gets going. Um, oh, okay, I'm good. Um, I'm Alexis Madrigal. It's good to uh, good to be here. Um, I have an incredibly distinguished panel, so I'm not going to say uh, too much to start off with. But um, I would like to say that in in listening to Dan talk about all the institutional capabilities of the DoD, and having done a lot of research on what capabilities we had in terms of green tech research uh, over the 20th century, uh, we basically had none of those. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's we're at an exciting time in that we're even beginning to be able to think about uh, how well do the institutions that we need match up uh, with institutions that we have. Uh, and we have three uh, incredible uh, people here, two from the Department of Energy and one from the Department of Defense. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about uh, what their institutions' capabilities are uh, and how they, how they can uh, improve them. Um, first up, we have Dr. Arun uh, Majumdar. Uh, he um, is well known in energy circles as the head of ARPA-E, um, which is an attempt to bring on more uh, high-risk uh, research into the Department of Energy portfolio. Um, I'm going to read a few of his accomplishments here. Uh, he was uh, the Associate Laboratory Director for Energy and Environment at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which if you've never been out there, uh, is an amazing uh, innovation ecosystem, as well as just like a place. It's like beautiful. It's like a, worth the trip if you can, if you can ever make it. Um, his uh, research career, uh, he's worked in energy conversion, transport, storage, uh, and you know, from molecular systems all the way up to, to large energy systems. Um, he's elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering for, the, for his pioneering work uh, across all those fields. Um, and it just all around uh, one of the country's leading energy technologists. Um, sitting next to him uh, is Kathy Filler. Uh She is now the Acting Undersecretary for Energy um, and the Assistant Secretary for Energy uh, Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, she is essentially the nexus of all the things that the DOE is doing right now. Uh, and is absolutely an incredible person to have on this panel. Um, uh, she also previously uh, was the founding CEO of the Alliance for Climate Protection, uh, which I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, sitting next to her, we have uh, Jeffrey uh, Mark. How do I say your last name? Marcusy. Sorry about that. Um, he is here representing the uh, Department of Defense. He works for the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, uh, where he's the executive uh, director. Um, we're particularly excited uh, to have him here, uh, given what's been said in the earlier panels about the importance of the DOD uh, in innovation, and because his program works at the, at the intersection of the EPA, uh, the DOD, and, and the DOE. Um, we're not going to have them do their traditional spiels. Uh, we're kind of assuming that people in this room have probably heard them uh, one or 20 times. Um, and we do want to have them have a moment to sort of introduce who they are uh, beyond, you know, the credentials you can fit into a, a one-paragraph bio. Um, I, I want to start with a little, um, so the Department of Energy has a short but incredibly complex history I'm sure a lot are familiar with in this, uh, in this room. I mean, sometimes it seems to me that it's like too sprawling for its own good. So why do we need an, another institution like your own? Like, why do we need 
uh, of the E and what makes it more capable of generating technological breakthroughs? I think it's, uh, is my mic on? Can you hear me? Great. Um, but I think it's, it, it's um, we are in a situation that the innovation in energy technologies is absolutely critical. And in addition to that, speed is of essence. So what ARPA-E is geared up for, and, and thanks to Congress for all the authorities that they've given us uh, in the statute, is to look at how to translate you know, discoveries and inventions and science into technologies that do not exist today. But if they did, it would provide U.S. competitiveness, it would provide national security, etc. So, so these are high-risk proposition, just like DARPA was created in response to Sputnik in 1958, to look beyond and look for technologies that did not exist at that time, like the internet, GPS, etc. But if they did, it would change the ball game, not only for the national security, but for other economic security as well. Well, in the energy, I think this is, we are in that moment in history, uh, given the global uh, dynamics that are going on, that it is, there's issues of national security, not just for us, but for other nations as well. So everyone is trying to look for a model of how to address this problem in a sustainable way. And for that, technology innovation is at the key. It's not the only thing. It is necessary, but not sufficient, but is absolutely necessary. So our role is to look for those technologies, those you know, discoveries in science, and look at the market, look at both sides, and see what is there in the science and engineering that can address the market and see what markets are there that science can engineering. So it's really where the intersection of that, looking for those technologies that do not exist today. Okay, but if they did, it would provide the U.S. competitiveness, it would provide, it'll be disruptive, it will, and it'll make today's technologies obsolete. That's what the role is. And I think it's, you know, we are in that similar situation, Sputnik-like moment, that, you know, where DARPA was created, we're trying to do that for the energy sector. But haven't there always been people in DOE who tried to do that? What makes ARPA-E different from, you know, uh, the entire history of DOE thinkers who were like, you know, it'd be really great, cheap, really efficient solar cell, you know? What makes ARPA-E? Right. Well, I mean, if you look at it, there's, there's the Office of Science, which is looking at science. This is discoveries, new tools, new computation tools, new experimental tools to look for, you know, look at the interaction of energy and matter. This is really understanding that's absolutely you know, essential. And that's the foundation. And we have the best science and engineering infrastructure in the world, and we need to keep it that way. The applied office, and let Kathy talk about that, is looking for, for example, you know, lithium-ion battery. This is absolutely critical to make sure that the cost of lithium-ion batteries, okay, scale down in cost so that it becomes this market competitive so that electric cars becomes cheaper than internal combustion engine, right? So if we could do that with lithium-ion batteries, that's great. But we have to look at for batteries that are beyond lithium-ion, which are five times or four times higher, you know, energy density, you know, four times lower cost, so that the performance cost ratio is a factor of 10. And if you have read Andy Grove's book, Only the Paranoid Survive, of 10x factor can be game-changing. And we are trying to do those game-changing innovations, okay, which could make the lithium-ion batteries obsolete, but if we don't know whether it's going to succeed, and there are you know, five different approaches to get there in terms of performance cost. So we have to look for these early stage high risk investments. And if some of them are successful, we like to hand it over, you know, so there's the, you know, she's catching the baby. <laughs> we like to hand it over to them to scale that technology and make it even, even more market compatible and then collectively provide the U.S. technologically. And this speed, and let me just emphasize, speed is of essence out here because we are in a competitive world. And that's what we're trying to do out here. Well, Kathy, because uh, Arun opened the door and I was uh, reading last week, Joe Brown, when you, uh, Climate Prog Progress blogger, uh, when you were first appointed, said that your job was all about deployment, deployment, uh, deployment. Um, and I guess I would love to know how you're thinking about your job differently now than, uh, than your predecessors did in terms of deploying clean energy technologies faster so we can meet this kind of speed and scale um, needs. Yeah. Um, I see my responsibilities as marrying innovation with uh, hastening the market uptake. 
So again, just to back up a second, I mean, look, we really we have, we have the whole value chain at DOE. We have the very the basic science all the way to massive deployment through some of our loan programs and everything else, and everything in between. And the place that where where my organization fits is 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 the is applied R and D, and then the demonstration and deployment, and then when we're successful at that, we inform policy. Now, what I've said to the folks that are in my research areas is, let's come up with research programs that can get us within striking distance of what the competition is in a clean energy sense, right? So every clean energy technology, every non-carbon emitting technology, what we're trying to do in solar, in wind, in, in batteries, is drive that cost down in a near-term time frame, say to within, I don't know, maybe 120% of what the competition is, something like that, notionally. And then policy can close that the remaining gap. So we're marrying innovation, which is, which is the, the relentless pursuit of reducing the cost of the cathode, figuring out how to do, how to do lithium ion batteries better, how to actually improve the reliability of the drivetrain on wind turbines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that we're within striking distance of, say, a gas combined cycle plant. And then we, have, we work with the Congress and say, look, these technologies are all big. They're ready for prime time. They're out there in our de demonstration projects. We've deployed them through the Recovery Act. Now what we need is to create a safe haven for the capital, and you do that through policy. Um, Jeffrey, I, I can imagine that maybe the audience is uh, slightly less familiar with your organization um, than, than with some of the others. I mean, what role do you play within the DOD? And then what role do you see the DOD playing uh, in, the, in the broader discussion? So like, I guess the real question is, what does the DOD do better right. in energy than than DOE or somebody else? Well, I think that's a good question. And there's been a lot of discussion already about DOD's historic role in innovation. And Dan Sarowitz put up a view graph, which I'm going to have to get from him, because I like that one. But first, you have to understand how DOD uses energy and values it, OK? We are clearly the largest energy user in the world. We represent roughly 3 quarters of the, the total energy use of the federal government. Um, in 2008, we directly spent $20 billion. That's a direct appropriated funds, not what our contractors spent to run their facilities. You know, in 2008, if you looked at our direct carbon footprint and we were a nation, the Department of Defense would be in the top 40 of the world. So energy is critical for an institution as large as DOD. Uh, but we think about energy in two big baskets, essentially. One is what we call operational energy. That's the energy to fuel our aircraft or ships to uh, deploy the soldiers in Afghanistan or Iraq. And it's critical, and it's the largest component currently. But there's another part, which is what I'd like to focus on today, because I think it has, has a strong connection and potential partnership with DOE. And that's what we call our installation energy. Okay, we spend $4 billion a year just managing our fixed infrastructure in this country here. Most of that's electricity, but it's also natural gas, steam, uh, fleet vehicles on our installations as well. And though that's roughly maybe, you know, 25 to 30 percent of the dollars we spend, it's over 40 percent of our carbon footprint. And if you look in the future, you know, when hopefully deployments can scale down, it'll reach for the Army maybe up to 80 percent of their carbon footprint. So the energy we spend on our infrastructure is critical, and it overlaps the needs of the civilian sector very strongly. So the question arises, what's DOD's appropriate role there? What can we do that's positive? What's our role versus the Department of Energy? Well, I think first it's, it's helpful to understand just the scale of DOD, because if you haven't been in the services or if you haven't worked with DOD, most people really don't comprehend it. I mean, we have around 500 installations. We have 300,000 buildings, over 2 billion square feet of occupied space. That's more than an order of magnitude more than GSA. The only institution in the world which is comparable in space is actually Walmart, and they're probably about five times smaller, and that's a shocking figure how big their space is. Um, but one of the things that's also unique is we have an incredible diversity of built infrastructure. Our installations are essentially small communities. During nine to five periods, there are 100,000 people working on a big military base. We have hospitals, office buildings barracks, which are like hotels in some sense, single-family houses, light industrial facilities. So we are a microcosm in the energy use of the rest of the country. So why do we care about those issues there, and what are we trying to do? Um, it really comes down to three things. Okay, one, 
We've got a driver to reduce our energy usage or our energy intensity. You know, why do we want to do that? It's straight economics. You know, people look at the DOD budget and think, oh, it's enormous, you can afford everything. I guarantee you there is vicious competition for every dollar in the defense budget. And so reducing $4 billion a year is critical to meet the Secretary's initiative. We also have legal mandates to do that, and we're concerned about our carbon footprint. We see renewable energy as one way to get there, and so we really want to increase the use of renewable and on-site generation installations. But the final sort of driver which ties it together is our concern on energy security. Um, the installations here in this country are critical for carrying out missions both abroad and domestically. And they're dependent, like every other institution in this country, on the current grid. And they suffer from the fragility of the grid. But the department's come to recognize that we have to have the capability to operate even in grid outages for long periods of time to conduct our national security mission. So those drivers have made us think about, you know, how are we going to achieve the goal? These are energy, increasing renewable, increasing the security of our installation. And the role of innovation comes in because if you just do the straight economics, we cannot afford with current available technologies to reach our goals in the time frame, and I think time frame is important as the room talked about, that we want to make. So the role for DOD we see, particularly for this class of technologies which overlap the civil sector, is to be a test bed for them, to be a place in which we can take the high risk to try out new technologies, where we can partner with DOE, directly with the private sector, with the venture capital sector, to bring on technologies which haven't been used yet or haven't been widely deployed, get the lessons learned, find out what are the winners and losers. Uh, one of the unique things, I think, in the innovative cycle of the Department of Defense that's different than many other agencies is within the Department of Defense, no one's ever criticized for trying to pick winners and losers. I get, my job is to pick winners and hopefully identify the losers early, right? That's what my boss wants me to do. And that's a little different, okay? Because we are not only an R&D culture, but we have a huge deployment and implementation role. So we can serve as a test bed to get these technologies over the valley of death, and then we can be an early market, okay? It's, the calculation is pretty straightforward. If we test 10 technologies and one is highly successful, we can deploy that at 100 places and make a profit. Um, Kathy, how do you design your research programs to be able to link into these kinds of early markets? It's like, how, Are there changes that you've made to make it easier for the DOE to interact with DOE and other places that might be interested in buying things early? I mean, it's a, there's no magic bullet, but what we've done is basically broken down each of our research programs into component parts. So what comprises, uh, what comprises a biofuels facility? How much of it is feedstock? How much is capital plant and equipment? It, what do we need to do to have it be competitive with the price of oil, the commodity price of oil? How many plants do we need to build to get it to that com competitive, com competitive price? So, and again, I, I mentioned biofuels because we're actually doing some in some really interesting conversations with the Department of Defense. It's taken a real leadership position in moving toward um, more greater use of biofuels. So, what we do we do there is we say we've got a research program that by 2012 or 2013 can reduce the feedstock by this much, can improve the conversion efficiency by this much, but we still think the price is going to be 20 percent, 30 percent more than than what the market will bear right now. And at that point. We go, to our, do we go to our friends across the river and say, hey, you guys interested in helping us with a pioneer plant? And we see if we can work out closing that gap on, on getting that pioneer plant up. And if we get that pioneer plant up, then, and it's successful, then the private sector can follow and can come in. And we're doing that similar sort of activity with, with solar, with wind, and everything else. We've also established, say, a solar demonstration zone on the former Nevada test site. Um, in, in, in Nevada, where we're basically set aside some land so that some of our innovation on solar that's been done in partnership with universities in the private sector can get immediate sighting. What you find out is with the early stage stuff, time is money, it's a pain in the neck to get it sighted. So we basically streamline that so that you can get out there with say a five megawatt demonstration, work out the kinks and the bugs, and again, if it works, the private sector can come in and develop it further. So in every single technology area, we just sort of break it down, figure out where we get the cost benefits, 
get it out into the field. I mean, we, you know, comp do competitive solicitation so we get the best and the brightest minds in the country working with us. Um, and then hopefully you're getting ready for the private sector uptake. Now, what changes have you made? There? Have there been things, I mean, given that uh, now relative to, you know, 10 or, or 15 years ago, we understand climate challenge is much more pressing. I mean, are there things about the way DOE works that are, you know, remarkably different or, or reforms that you're trying to make in, 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 the, in the department? I, th I think we're trying to move more quickly. I mean, I think, think both, you know, Arun and I, and I think the Department of Defense feels very strongly that we, the clock is ticking, and we want to get out there very quickly and de demonstrate the technologies in the next couple of years so that we can begin this transformation. I think that the pace at which this administration is moving within the Department of Energy is much, much quicker. Um, the, the, the Recovery Act was a gift in that sense because we had very, very near-term milestones that we had to get all of the money obligated to the, to the grantees and the, to the outside world by September 30th of this last year, and we did it. And the organization, coming in, the organization thought, how are we ever going to obligate $38 billion of funding so quickly? But the organization hopped to it, and we, 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 we created it, and we did it all with transparency and accountability. And I said, I said to the team at DOE, I said, this could actually be a Harvard Business School case study in terms of how quickly, how, how agile we were, how transparent we were, how competitive we were. We had thousands of peer reviewers. I mean, Arun's program alone had how many peer reviewers? Several thousand. Yeah, I mean, several thousand peer reviewers, so it was all professionally done. You might not have guessed a few years ago that the Department of Energy could, could be that agile and that market, that sort of that market uh, attuned, but we were. So, and, and, and again, that's just good management, I think. So what comes after our, I mean, since that seems to be a, a big question on everyone's mind, um, is, is this going to be the down payment that, that people uh, hope that it is? And this could be uh, for anyone on the group. I mean, what do you see as, as being able to help us keep going down this kind of innovation channel? Well, I mean, I'll go first and then toss it over to you guys. I, I actually do think that it is an amazing down payment. I mean, in EERE alone, we've got 7,000 projects under management. They are present in every city in this country through, through a number of programs. No longer is the notion of a green job or a, or a clean energy technology remote to anybody in this country because somebody you know in your town is working in the field because we've got all these projects that are under construction. We've got retrofits that are being done. So the, sort of the mystery and the remoteness of the notion of clean energy and green jobs is, 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 has, has dissipated if we can communicate it effectively. So I think indeed, it will, be, it will be a very good down payment. Now, we've, where we could, we have constructed programs and designed them so that they can be transformational. And I'll give you one example. Well, it's, a, it's, it's a program we're calling Better Buildings, and it is a, it is a neighborhood-based energy efficiency retrofit program. We've selected through a competitive pro process 38 different communities across the country that are gonna take $1 of federal money, apply $5 from other sources, and build sustainable business models to go retrofit buildings, houses and, and, uh, and retail, on, on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. Why do we want to do that? Because then we, we, we eke out extra costs. If you do it on a geographically contiguous basis, you actually can actually put the money into the retrofits themselves. Part of that process is also a financing. So that essentially, if you're the householder and somebody knocks on your door and says, for no money down, I'm, actually gonna, I'm gonna actually save you money on your energy bills. So what we hope is that this little bit of money from the Recovery Act is creating business models that can be replicated so that in a couple years' time, we are actually retrofitting five to 10 million American homes a year and you know, four to eight billion square feet of commercial space a year, but based on the business models, like, think of it like the cable TV roll-up that happened 20 years ago. We need businesses to come along, private enterprise to come along and see, I can actually run a business doing this. Everyone, I feel like the, the end of the stimulus package might be very important for RPE. Um, how are you guys preparing for this, and how are you uh, thinking long term while the money is actually kind of short term? Well, let me just actually step back for a moment and talk about the history of RPE. It actually started way before the Recovery Act. Yeah. It started in 2005, a report by the other national academies called Rising Over the Getting Storm, which was led by Norm Augustine and his team, Ms. Kitty, when it was felt that this is the moment that uh, there's a storm gathering. By the way, there's a, there's a new report that has come out, which is Gathering Storm Revisited, where the storm is now approaching Category 5. So, I mean, right. I, if you haven't read it, it is it's both amusing and scary. <laughs> but I think it's worth reading it, uh, because it's a reality check. So it started in 2005, and Congress, you know, um, codified it in America Competes Act in the previous administration, 2007. And then 
and there were sort of there were many blessings that that thing that things went right. Um, the Recovery Act was what launched us, and this time frame that Kathy mentioned that by, by September 2010 you got to obligate this money. That put in the efficiency in our way, which is now you know there in the PCAS report that we have reduced the contracting time to two months now, and the inception of an idea and the workshop and everything to the fully contract projects to six to eight months. Anything below that is risky. So this is what we've achieved. And we are saying that, okay, this is, not, this is not just the Recovery Act. We're going to maintain this kind of speed and efficiency in the government, okay, in, in our, our E, going moving forward because we have shown that it can be done. So that is what has benefited. And of course, all these people that we are funding now, the 120-something projects, which, by the, by the way, will be showcased in the RP Energy Innovation Summit, which is March 1st and 2nd. Sorry to sort of pitch this now. <laughs> right? Can't stop yet. <laughs> and, and so that will, you know, we will showcase not only the RP funded technologies, but also the technology that we could not fund because of the constraints and money. But it needs an ecosystem to flourish. To, and that ecosystem with competition, collaboration, will eventually succeed. I don't know which one will. But an ecosystem has to flourish. So we're inviting all of them, they'll be showcased. But that's really the history of RP. And then and the Recovery Act sort of put the speed and the efficiency which we've now gotten, and we you know, hope to maintain that in the future. Um, how different is it? I mean, you were at a national lab doing energy research, and, and even, not even one of the kind of old line national labs. I mean, even you were at an innovative one run by Steve Chu. Um, uh, how different does RPE feel, and are there, are there specific things about the way that RPE is run uh, that make it easier to, to make breakthroughs in? Well, I mean, I, I should also say that I was not only in the National Lab, I was also a faculty in campus, so the idea that students today, by the way, this is not to be underestimated. In fact, this is the leverage point that we have. The youth today in the universities, okay, across the nation, Regardless of the discipline, whether it's science, engineering, business, public policy, law school, they've all broken the boundaries and formed an energy or sustainability club or whatever you may call it. And we need to harness this as much as we can. And we are doing that right now. So I just want to point out there's a university aspect of it. And also the ecosystem of the, of the Bay Area. It's really important that those kind of competitive and collaborative ecosystems with this human capital, financial capital all together is, needs to be created not just in, across the United States. So, so that is something that, you know, that is important to the learning lessons. Now, coming to Washington, D.C., of course, it was a totally new land landscape for me mm -hmm. <laughs> and to understand and navigate yeah. that. And, uh, but I think you know, the, the biggest pleasant surprise I found is the number of good ideas that are there, out there. And this ecosystem of the innovation ecosystem is not saying how much we should jump, it's how high we should be jumping. And that is absolutely to be leveraged. Okay, this is the strength, competitive edge for the United States. This needs to be leveraged. And you know, we saw that in RP the first round. This is before I joined. 3,700 concept papers showed up. It broke down the computer system of DOE. And we got a better computer system now, which is of course now being used in you know, other parts of DOE as well. So this, is, this, this response of this ecosystem was absolutely fantastic. Now, of course, we could not fund all of them, okay? But that's, that, that ecosystem is there, and we need to support them as much as we can. That's where the Hewlett's and Packard's are for the energy. The pages and the and, and, you know, winds are there today. They don't know it. We don't know who they are. But we need to figure out, you know, a group of them, and someone will rise from that. One other thing, if I may, one of the things, that's, the things that I love about Arun's stable of investments is that the, 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 the folks that are doing the work are very diverse. It's, I mean, some of it is the university, is coming out of the university, some of it is coming out of inventors and entrepreneurs. But one of the things that I think we need to hang on to and continue to nurture is this great innovative history that we've got in the United States. I mean, I, I lived overseas for 12 years in Australia, and I, you know, and I, and I absolutely adore it. Um, coming back to the United States, there's just sort of, it genuinely, it's in our DNA that no idea is a bad idea, and RPE gives a, gives a home for that no idea is a bad idea, let's test it, let's think about it, let's be collegial about it, let's suss it out. And, and, and it's, just, it's, it's just fantastic, the energy level, and it's going to need to continue. I mean, the, the, the institution of RPE, yes, the injection of funds came with the Recovery Act, but it is a really, really special and unique thing that we need to continue to foster, I think. Um, 
I, I want to get back to, to Jeffrey, um, only because I feel like we, as, as much as I'm like, yay, energy industrial complex, I mean, there are some things about this that are a little bit uh, worrisome. Can you see anything from your position within the DOD that's troublesome about using uh, the Defense Department to help deploy uh, technology? Uh, no, in fact, I, you know, I'm a big believer in the government does best when you match up raw self-interest of an institution with the policy goals of the government. And this is an example in which raw DOD self-interest improved security, improved efficiency, improved military readiness matches up with us trying to grab and stimulate energy technology. I mean, one of the things you know, the energy sector, as a number of people have talked about, is qualitatively different than a lot of other technical sectors. The entrance to the marketplace has a lot of barriers. It's incredibly cost sensitive, and first deployments often don't get made. Many of the decisions, particularly energy thing for the built infrastructure, are so widely distributed and have so many split incentives in who makes the decision versus who gets the gain that we in DOD have basically come to the conclusion that if we sit back as a passive observer, we can't meet our goals. And that for, to be honest, a very modest investment, we can leverage the huge investment DOE's made in the last few years, as well as the big investment for the venture capital community and the big industries, and bring it together. The, the other thing I just want to point out related to um, a comment a room made is that, and Kathy made too, is one of the things that DOD has a long history of, and we, we think what RPE is doing is, is really following that history, is creating partnerships between both academia, industry, both small and big, because that's what stimulates innovation to make the jump. So that you have the sort of leaders of new ideas, there's a couple to people who want to make a fortune Okay, it's about the profit motive, and so you've got to make that coupling between industry, academia, and the national labs. So some of the projects that we're working on on our installations now, which most of which had past DOE history, are literally partnerships between major U.S. companies who see us as a big market, one or two of the principal universities, and some of the DOE labs, each playing their role so that it's not just, oh, this is an interesting science project, but at the end, we can issue an RFP to buy hundreds of these. So it's really our self-interest that drives it. But I mean, there are like multiple DOD goals, and, I, and, and it seems to me, at least, that you could sort of break them apart. Like, it becomes a triple bottom line situation where, at the end of the day, you know, most entrepreneurs are like, well, we got to make money first, and so that ends up becoming, like, the dominant thing. Um, and there are multi I mean, there are non-clean ways that DOD installations could be off the grid, too, right? So. Um, what, what gives us faith that the DOD has a, a real commitment to actual clean energy technology? So, so let's, let's think about this grid situation to be concrete. Um, you know, yes, there are ways to be off the grid. We can go buy a diesel generator for every single building we operate. I tell you, we're not going to do that. It's just not cost effective and it's not a smart way to manage an installation. What the smart way to do it, both economically and to make sure it's not fragile but stable, is to think about future smart microgrids and how we can deploy them. This is an example in which DOD has a different value proposition in the private sector. There are some parts of the private sector where they have a similar one, that being up 24-7 with high reliability is worth the dollars. But that allows us to be an early user of the technology. And you know these are technologies which I don't envision coming out of DOD labs. They'll be coming out of DOE investments and private sector. Um, and they're the cheaper and more robust way to make that secure. The old way is very fragile and very expensive. Um, and, and some of this at least goes to sort of how, how our research efforts play in the international community. Um, and I, I wanted to ask, ask Kathy, um, going forward, you know, you've been in this, uh, in this field for a long time, time, looking at these issues, working you know, in different types of organizations. How much of the research burden do we expect the, the U.S. or research opportunity do we expect uh, the U.S. to uh, to shoulder going 20 years out versus China versus India uh, versus uh, the European Union countries? Well, I, th I think that I, I would say it's an opportunity. Um, so I don't. It's not a burden. It is an opportunity. I, I think, um, and I think 
It's a good question because I think China sees it as an opportunity and India sees it as an opportunity. So I actually think it's a competitive opportunity for us. We have a great history of innovation, a great history of invention and discovery, a great track record of translating that discovery and things that will work well for our export markets as well as for, in, for homegrown indigenous markets. And we need to keep actively pursuing it. So I, I, I think that it behooves us to figure out what combination of government R&D in, in collaboration with corporate R&D needs to happen, but it absolutely must happen. I mean, I think it was Norm Augustine's quote that sort of said, look, you, you'll get this better, than, but more right than I will, but when you, when you actually, when you're flying in a plane and you've got a problem, you don't, you don't reduce, your, reduce your weight by getting rid of one of the engines. R&D is that engine. We can't, even though times are tight fiscally, we need to continue to invest in R&D, and we've got the track record to do it. Yeah. Norm's so logical, and then it gets to Congress. You know? um, <laughs> but uh, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the links that, that we need to other countries, right? Not just as, as competitors, um, but also in, in terms of, uh, of cooperation and, and information sharing. And Look, I mean, I think it's uh, fair to say that China is doing what is right for China. I mean, they are developing an infrastructure which they need for their population whose income level is increasing. Okay, and they need the energy to do that to have, have to maintain their economic growth. But they share the same concern for our security in terms of importing oil. They have the same issue because they're a net oil importer. So is India. India is doing exactly the right thing that they should be doing. So there's some shared concerns and there's a huge market opportunity. If you can figure out how to develop technology out here and scale it out here and, ha and address those markets, that is the biggest opportunity that I can think of today. Okay, so this is something that we need, we need to think global, in term, and, but make local, all right, and sell global. So that is one thing. The other is that everyone is trying to figure out how to reduce oil imports, okay, and how to do it in technology way. Now, today, of course, they're biofuels. But everyone's looking at biofuels, but it's expensive. It needs to be scaled in terms of cost and, and, and volume. There are other approaches that we need to address that as well. And I think that should be on the table, and I can talk, talk about our RFP program on that. But this is a market opportunity that we should not be missing, and we should be partnering. It's an experiment going on in China right now, and in, in how they're deploying, what technology they are, uh, they are deploying, and they should do that. And if you learn from the experiment what works and what does not, when we come to our infrastructure trying to address that, we learn from that and we do the smart thing. So it's extremely important that we collaborate and learn jointly in their experiment, but also address the market in a competitive way. Um, you mentioned possible breakthrough technologies. I, uh, I'd love to hear breakthrough technologies that could actually stop uh, the U.S. from increasing to oil imports. Let me um, give you one. Yeah. Okay. So um, today, if you look at biofuels, every all biofuels today is based on photosynthesis. Okay. So you got sunlight, you got photosynthesis one and two. And you use what is called the Calvin-Benson cycle. I don't, I don't want to go too technical, but this is the Calvin cycle that you use. Melvin Calvin got a Nobel Prize for this, right? Calvin cycle to convert sunlight and make chemical bonds. That process is less than 1% efficient. Less than 1% efficient. And so you, you need a lot of land. You need water to develop that. There are others. So the, what does Calvin cycle do? It takes the energy and takes two carbon dioxide molecules and make carbon-carbon bonds. Okay, so it's what is called carbon fixation. Now, there, it turns out there are many other approaches in biology itself that we have not used that can fix carbon dioxide and make carbon-carbon bonds that are up to 90% efficient, and we have not even used that. So this is total white space out there. Out there. So RP created a program called Electrofuels to take that alternate route to see whether we can take not just sunlight, but direct electricity, hydrogen sulfide, which is a waste product in natural gas and oil, Okay, we throw it today to use the energy from hydrogen sulfide and, and see if you can do carbon-carbon bonds. Even if it's not 90%, even if it's 10%, it's 10 times better than biofuels today. And perhaps we could use... So this is totally... No one in the world is looking at, at this. If this works, I don't know whether it's going to work or not, but if this works, it gives the United States a competitive advantage. And this could address you know, some of the you know, new ways of creating fuels. Um, Let's go completely to the other side, because I feel like we've talked uh, production a lot, and I know you guys uh, wanted to talk a little bit about energy innovation and consumption as well. Um,
just because we are here with uh, the Breakthrough Institute. They've uh, been out strong, actually, talking about um, problems in the way that we think about energy efficiency, um, and particularly in the way that we think about the, the rebound effect or when we uh, make energy use more efficient, whether or not people use more on various different levels from micro to macro scale. Um, I mean, I think everyone agrees that energy is a really good idea, um, regardless of, of its impact uh, on actual uh, carbon reductions. But I mean, do we, how do we deploy it as a, um, as a tool for, for combating climate change? Like, are there ways that we can reduce, uh, you know, hypothetical or real rebound effects? Maybe we sort of can. Yeah, I mean, the, the program I talked about, Better Buildings, is trying to, to get at all of those kind of niggly barriers that we've had for a long, long time. And there's the, the access to capital is one of them, so we have a financing component. Of this The information is another one, so we've, we've got a, an information component to it. I mean, frankly, for most people, your energy bill is usually a pretty low part of your overall cost of either running your household or running your company. So it's, it's, it's one of the classic economic market failures, right? The, the, the dollars are kind of lying there on the ground, but you're kind of too busy to lean down and pick them up. So we're, we're just kind of institutionally going at the make it easy. Our, our basic mantra for energy efficiency is we need to make it easier to be efficient than to be inefficient. So you can do this through technology, where you have appliances that automatically go on and off. And when we first did, invented the Energy Star program 19, 20 years ago now, um, the idea was we, we, again, it all started with computers, and what we knew, what we noticed back then is that the fastest growing load in the commercial se sector was PCs. And everybody left their PCs on all night because they thought if they turned them off, they'd lose their data. So the classic response was, well, let's just do an education program. But what we came up with back then was, well, you know, we haven't been very successful with getting people to turn off their lights, so let's do something else. So we went to the computer companies and said to them, but you guys have in laptops and portable computers, as they were called back then, a function that makes them go to sleep after a period of inactivity to conserve the battery. What if we put that powered management capability into desktops, into PCs? And the, the computer company said, and I remember, still remember going to the meetings, Apple and Cupertino and an IBM, I'm up in, um, in upstate New York, and they said, oh, the engineer said, oh, shoot, we can do this. We've wanted to do this for a while. And I would say, well, why didn't you do it? I said, well, there's no marketing reason to do it. The marketing department wouldn't let us. So, we, so the marketing guys are sitting there at the Apple meeting, and I said, well, look, how about if we give you an environmental good guy sticker to help you sell more computers? And thus, the Energy Star logo was born. And so it was really, and with a lot of energy efficiency, and, you know, and, and then, of course, it's just expanded. So now, Energy Star happens to be like one of the most recognized brands in this country. And you, you know why it works, is that it's easy. I mean, we don't kid ourselves that the only thing you're looking at when you're buying a fridge is energy efficiency. But all of the things being equal, you've got the ice maker, and you've got the, the fruit thing, and you've got the special cheese component. Oh my gosh, and this one only consumes 400 kilowatt hours a year. Isn't that marvelous? The cool thing about, as well about Energy Star is that it pulls the market forward so you get brand new innovation, which then can help inform the rest of the market and help us in our statutory responsibilities for setting appliance efficiency standards. The appliance efficiency standards that we have issued already in the Obama administration are going to save um, consumers somewhere around $350 billion over the next 20 years. These are consumer protection measures. They are saving people from wasting money. So, so that, there's a combination of activities. The reason, it, and the reason I love it is that it's, it's fussy, but the reason that most people don't bother is because it's fussy. But we'll get our heads around it. Efficiency is critical, and I think, at least in the Department of Defense, we're going to meet our goals predominantly through efficiencies. But I think one of the things people sometimes forget is not just efficiencies about individual items and component technologies, but which are critical, and the Energy Star program is really important for that. But we don't treat our energy infrastructure as an assistance approach. Um, you know, when the Department of Defense builds a new aircraft, we flow down requirements. We know trade-offs through modeling. If I do this, weight reduction, that, power stuff. When I operate a building, first of all, we rarely build them efficiently, but I think the bigger issue is we don't operate them efficiently. And the Department of Defense, like the rest of the country, is really not going to build its way in new buildings out of our energy problem. We would live with the stock we have right now. And most of the Department of Defense's buildings are, you know, 40 to 50 years old, pretty squat and ugly, and they look like the rest of the buildings in the country, okay? So the challenge we face is, you know, how do we take the advances in IT, in modeling, 
and create a scalable systems approach for the retrofit market so that we can not get the 10 to 20 percent efficiencies we get through the current process, but we knock energy use down by 50 percent. And we have proof points around this country of people doing this. What we hope to do, leveraging and working with DOE and using our infrastructure, is show or develop a process that is not just one off because some developer happens to be green, but this is deployed across the whole stock of buildings. And a 50% reduction in existing building energy is probably one of the biggest things we can do to fight climate change. Um, I'm interested in uh, sort of game changers that we don't talk about a lot. I, I think one of the things I've noticed since coming out to DC from the Bay Area is that there's a, the whole idea of the Washington consensus is like totally real. You're like, oh, a lot of people believe a lot of the same things about, you know, kind of energy futures. Um, and uh, I'm really interested in what you guys see as, and, and kind of go down the line here, um, as something that could truly change the way that, like 10 years from now, we look back and we go, oh, we didn't really see that coming. Um, like that was, that was something that was a, you know, a, a classic black swan. Like what are, what's something like that? And could be policy, could be technical, could be uh, political, any of those things? Well, I mean, those are, it's as our, American philosopher Yogi Berra has said, it's very hard to predict, especially the future, right? right? Um, but there are a few indications that, um, for example, if he could use carbon dioxide as a feedstock to create fuel, okay, that is a game changer. Because that is basically closing the loop. Uh, and if you want to create fuel without fossil fuel, you need carbon from somewhere. <laughs> and so, uh, if you could close the loop, that is a total game changer, and all the biofuels and electrofuels that I talked about is an attempt at that. The question is, can we do it cost effectively? And the economics of that is really important because one of the roles of technology is to bring down the cost so that it becomes market compatible. You don't need subsidies to then scale it. Okay, so that is, that's one. Our electrical infrastructure, as I say this when I think the secretary has said, and I've stolen it from the secretary in this case, is if, you, if, if Edison were alive today, you look at the CD-ROM and said, what the heck is that? Okay, or a memory stick and say, what the heck is that? Or LED. You look at the grid and say, that looks familiar. Okay? And a grid infrastructure is old. Okay? It is, we buy most of our transformers from China, and, the, and they are pretty dumb, okay? Mm -hmm. So we created a power electronics program that, can, can, that uses, the leverage is DOD investments in wide band gap semiconductors, okay? And combines it with magnetics um, and goes to higher frequency so that the size reduces. The inductance and the capacitance and the impedance for that, you know, you know is all smaller now. And you could reduce the size from, you know, of a substation transformer from about 8,000 pounds to about 100 pounds. That'll fit into a suitcase. You don't need a crane then. And the cost will come down, your liability goes up. That's a component of an infrastructure which is where we use essentially Kirchhoff's law <laughs> of current to go from one point to that, that point. We don't know where it'll go. We cannot route electricity, okay? Yeah. So if someone could, so we are looking at that infrastructure and so that if he could potentially route things the right way, we increase reliability, mm -hmm. We increase resilience of a great infrastructure. And we don't have those, those components yet. Okay? So this is, if today's, what people say a smart grid is only measurements, phasor measurements units and you know, uh, smart meters, etc. That's just the measurement. What do you do with the measurement? The operating system for the grid has not yet been developed. And so I think if you think about, it's not going to be exactly the same as the internet, of course. This we're talking about power, AC and DC power. But that infrastructure could be game-changing and could enable a lot of distributed generation. All I mean, I can go on and on. I'll stop here. <laughs> but you know, that's the kind of innovation that we ought to develop. I'll do a technology one as well. Um, one, there's a program that we're working that, that that my office is working with Arun's office and working with the Office of Science on. It's called we call it Dollar a Watt or the Sunshot. And over the next five years, we are going to collaborate with researchers and industry people to, to basically invent a new way to do solar that's, uh, that's five to six cents a kilowatt hour. 
And the neat thing about photovoltaics is anywhere you have a photon, you could have electricity then. Because it doesn't need to be just sort of in the southwest where there's no clouds. Any place you've got it. And it's a, we, we've put this together, with, in, as I say, in collaboration with the outside world. And we're very, very excited. If you can get to five to six cents a kilowatt hour of PV installed, that is absolutely game changing. Do you see that happening? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're on it. We're on it. And the speed is important. Yes, we so need within to do five it years. For, to get global competitiveness. And so we are partnering within the DOE as a joint program on that. Well, you know, I think there are a lot of technical changes. I mean, one technology which would be game changing is storage. I mean, you know, we, don't, we think about energy problems in a constrained way because we don't cost effectively can store electricity. Um, but I think there are other game changers having to do with process, how we make decisions, deploy, and manage our systems. I mean, my talking to these venture capitalists out in California and some of the firms they have, who mostly grew out of the IT industry, they go look at how we manage buildings, ventilation, lighting, and just their jaw drops. They said, what decade are these guys in, okay? And it's not that the building industry is stupid. They're technically very smart. It has to, have, it has to do with the process, the policies, the deployment mechanisms. Those need to radically change so that we radically change how we manage our energy and our infrastructure as well. So let me ask you one uh, that has been kicking around a lot, particularly in the, the tech world that I'm um, a part of a lot of the time. Um, small modular nuclear reactors, I feel like, is, is something that, uh, you know, Bill Gates has really gotten behind possible energy miracle uh, kind of talk. Um, what do you think? Um, are they going to be something we're going to see in the future? Or is nuclear something that, uh, particularly, you know, in your neighborhood kind of nuclear installation, uh, too much for people still? Sure. But we're excited about it. We're really excited about it. I mean, essentially, what we, we've, we've been using small modular reactors in the Navy for a long time. And so what we need to do is adapt those, uh, change the fuel type a little bit, try them out, and, and I think we're pretty excited about the possible couple contribution they can, they can make. So. I think it's so, absolutely, sh I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, the department is working with DOE. I mean, one possible application is to power installations. Um, you know, I think right now the department is somewhat agnostic. They need to, you know, there are big questions, but they hold huge promise. I mean, base load that is zero carbon footprint at that level is a game changer. Um, but they're obviously, I don't expect, like in my neighborhood and Northwest Washington, anyone to approve a small modular nuke to go in. Uh, you know, it just, there are some practical local political issues which we have to be honest about and face. Well, I, I think it's, it's really a financial imperative. Uh, if you, you know, if you have a nuclear reactor that costs $10 billion, you're essentially taking the whole of a utility and, and some of the utilities and putting, and putting the stake on one thing. And that is always dangerous. Right, so it's a financial, it's a trade-off between economies of scale, what you get out of efficiency that you get out of scale, and a financial imperative. And I think if you could reduce to small modular reactors, you could perhaps bring the cost down of nuclear, which is a lot of construction costs. You can modularize that, and that will enable future, you know, reactors to be built at a much lower cost. And that is absolutely critical, and it also makes it enables you know financing much easier. So I think it, it's it's a good thing, and we are very very supportive of that. Well, I think we are going to uh, wrap up uh, pretty soon here. Um, uh, anything you guys want to ask each other? Um, I, I know you guys probably interact a lot, but I don't know. <laughs> or, or... I mean, we interact quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we're peas and carrots. Yeah, kind of you know, yeah, so. yeah. 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 I mean, I think you, know, you probably know the Department of Defense, as part of energy, uh, this summer signed the memorandum of agreement. Um, and, you know, I think historically the collaboration, and I mean over many decades, has gone up and down. But I actually think we're at a point now which is looking at a very new, much more substantive level of collaboration. And as in anything in government, you know, the devil's in the execution. You've got to actually do it. And so I think both agencies or departments, um, you know, are committed to try to figure out how to leverage each other's uh, capabilities and roles, and you know, we'll see how we do in the next few years.
the leadership is there. I mean, the, 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 the fun thing about coming back to Washington as part of this administration is that, you know, Secretary Chu feels this, feels all of these clean energy issues in his bones. I think, I think the leadership at the Pentagon is exactly the same way. There is this terrific alignment. And, and, and then what it is, is it, it is a management issue because you have these giant organizations that you, that you need to mobilize. Um, and again, for us, the Recovery Act was this great way to sort of mobilize those folks and say, yeah, we can do it and we can do it this fast. And so we're going to carry that forward. Right. I bet you guys feel the same. And the leadership in the department has a focus on energy unlike I've ever seen in my career. And just one simple classic Washington sign of it, if you look at the senior little leaders in the services, how many of them have added the word energy, energy to their title? <laughs> that tells you about their priorities, and I think that'll lead to a change. And I should say that, you know, so Jeff and I and many others, we talk very frequently about, and you know, uh, people from DOD, Jeff has been in our workshops, they've been in our program reviews, they've been in our panel reviews for proposals, so that it's, you know, it's not just a hand handoff, it has to be a partnership which is zipped up you know, in many different ways. And that's how it works, and I think that's what we're trying to do right now. So I don't have any questions for Jim. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, round of applause for